21 rare facts about heaven. Number one, heaven and earth will perish. John saw a new world in his vision where God lives with his people and there's no more sin, death, or sadness. In the beginning of the story, John says that the world we know will end. God made the earth knowing this would happen. A new heaven and new earth will replace our world and fix problems like climate change and chaos. According to the Bible, the earth and sky will eventually end, but you as a person will keep going even after they're gone. They'll wear out like old clothes, but you'll still be here. Psalm 102:26, New American Standard Bible. Even they will perish, but you endure. All of them will wear out like a garment, like clothing you will change them and they will pass away. The Bible unfailingly warns us that this particular world will not last forever. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, New American Standard Bible, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. In the discourse on the prophecies concerning the end times and the timeless essence of Jesus' teachings, he declared, my words will never pass away. This signifies that placing trust in Jesus holds greater wisdom than relying on anything fleeting in this world. Now, you might be wondering about the arrival of the new heaven. Well, stay tuned until the end and we'll provide an explanation. Additionally, Jesus alludes to the dissolution of heaven and earth in Matthew 5.18. Matthew 5.18, New American Standard Bible. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of a letter shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. In Revelation 21.1, John talks about a new heaven and earth he saw when everything old had disappeared. This means the physical world we know, with all its stuff, will be gone. The Bible says people will outlast this world, some in happiness forever and others in sadness forever. The current world will be replaced by a perfect one without any sin. We can learn about how this world will end in 2 Peter 3.10-12. through 12. 2 Peter 3:10 through 12, New American Standard Bible. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be discovered. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. In the book of Genesis, it said that the world was once wiped out by a massive flood during Noah's time, but God promised there wouldn't be another flood like that again, Genesis 9:11. Instead, it's believed that in the day of the Lord, the universe will be destroyed by fire. The prophet Isaiah also predicted that heaven and earth would pass away. Isaiah 34.4, New American Standard Bible. And all the heavenly lights will wear away, and the sky will be rolled up like a scroll. All its lights will also wither away, as a leaf withers from the vine, or as one withers from the fig tree. The people are assured by the Lord that while the heaven and earth may be passing away, His salvation is secure. Isaiah 51.6, New American Standard Bible. Raise your eyes to the sky. Then look to the earth beneath, for the sky will vanish like smoke, and the earth will wear out like a garment, and its inhabitants will die in the same way. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will not fail. Have you ever thought about the fact that heaven and earth will pass away? It's a realization that can give us a lot of perspective in life. When we remember that this world is not our permanent home, we can prioritize what's truly important and live with a sense of purpose. But in accordance with his promise, we expectantly await new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells, 2 Peter 3.13. Jesus tells us to have the proper priorities. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, Matthew 6.19 and 20. And Peter, after reminding us of the temporary nature of this world, says, so, beloved, since you are looking forward to these things, be diligent and make every effort to be found by him at his return, spotless and blameless, in peace that is inwardly calm with a sense of spiritual well-being and confidence, having lived a life of obedience to him. 2 Peter 3.14
The prophet Isaiah recorded God promising a new heavens and a new earth. Behold, I am creating new heavens and a new earth, and the former things of life will not be remembered or come to mind. Isaiah 65, 17. The glorious promise of God is that this earth will be made new. This will be a reversal of the curse of Eden. Number two, what Jesus said about heaven. Jesus spoke of the renewal of all things, the time when all things are made new. Jesus said to them, I assure you and most solemnly say to you in the renewal, that is the messianic restoration and regeneration of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me becoming my disciples will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel, Matthew 19, 28. The disciples will have a distinct responsibility during the future judgment, likely involving administration in the millennial kingdom. Moreover, the apostles had the privilege of contributing to a unique foundation for the church, and they are recognized with a special tribute in the New Jerusalem. Revelation 2114 New American Standard Bible. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Number three, when will this happen? There's some discussion among believers about when this renewal will take place. Some think it will happen when Christ returns and establishes his millennial kingdom, a thousand year reign on earth. They don't see this renewal as the same as the creation of the new heavens and new earth prophesied by Isaiah. That's expected to happen after the millennium. But how big will this new heaven be? Will every Christian be able to fit there? Stay tuned to find out. Number four, when God spoke from his throne, the new and the one who was seated on the throne said, Revelation 21, 5, New American Standard Bible. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. This means that the present order of creation will be replaced with a new one where only God's people will exist and live in the closest of relationships. We read, He who sat on the throne said, this is a powerful proclamation that originates directly from the throne of God. It's noteworthy because it's one of the rare instances in the book of Revelation where we witness God himself speaking unequivocally from his throne. We read, Behold, I make all things new. This statement is in the present tense. I am making everything new. This is the fulfillment of God's work of renewal and deliverance having begun here and now in our present time. Paul saw this transformation at work on this side of eternity. 2 Corinthians 5.17, New American Standard Bible. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this person is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. The importance of the vision's subject matter to the church and God's people cannot be overstated. As a result, God reiterates and ratifies its truth from the heavens to provide the highest level of assurance. Additionally, the realization of this vision is still many ages away and will be accompanied by numerous significant trials. Therefore, God desires it to be put into writing to serve as a lasting memory and constant source of guidance for his people. Number five, there are those who will have no part. Those who have not placed their trust in the promises of God will not have the opportunity to be a part of it. Revelation 21.8, New American Standard Bible. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and sexually immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Those who deny Jesus and turn away from their faith are not allowed to enter the new Jerusalem. We read of the cowardly. Really? Cowards? Can a person be condemned to hell merely for being cowardly? According to John, when he discusses cowardice, he's talking about a fear that prioritizes one's own safety over following Christ, not just natural timidity. A prominent Bible commentator used strong language to describe those who were easily frightened and lack courage. He referred to them as cowardly recreants, white-livered milksops, and afraid of every new step. Here's the deal. Among the sins of those who perish, cowardice and lack of faith are at the forefront, with the fearful leading the pack. 
Some people lacked the courage to face the challenges of religion and their fear came from their lack of faith. Even though they were too scared to follow Christ's teachings and fulfill their obligations to him, they still engaged in all sorts of detestable wickedness, murder, adultery, sorcery, idolatry, and lying. Their punishment? They have their share in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Those who couldn't withstand the heat in the name of Christ will have to face the consequences of their sins and burn in hell. Those who pass away will experience a second death, which will be much more terrifying and agonizing than the first. The pain and horror of the first death will lead them to an eternal state of dying and constant agony. The suffering that the damned will endure is a fitting consequence for their actions and desires, as well as the results of their sinful behavior. This misery will serve to highlight the happiness of the saved, while the joy of the righteous will only make the agony of the lost more painful. Jesus discussed hell extensively in his teachings. In fact, we can learn more about hell from Jesus' words than from any other part of the Bible combined. Jesus described hell as outer darkness. At the end of time, everyone will stand before Jesus Christ and he will divide humanity into sheep, those who demonstrate their faith in Jesus through their good actions, and goats, those who do not demonstrate their faith in Jesus through their good works. Revelation 21, 27, New American Standard Bible. And nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. In the realm beyond, the saints will experience complete purification, shedding all impurities as they approach death. Only those who are completely pure will be welcomed among the saints in the New Jerusalem. While earthly Christian communities may sometimes harbor a mix of good and bad individuals leading to challenges, the society in the New Jerusalem will be entirely untainted. To enter heaven, it's crucial to be free from openly profane behavior, as such individuals are not accepted there. While earthly churches may witness sacrilegious acts during solemn ceremonies, such behavior cannot be tolerated in heaven. It's important to note that the New Jerusalem is reserved exclusively for those who are called, chosen, and faithful without any association with hypocrites. Hypocrites may infiltrate earthly churches and remain hidden there for extended periods, perhaps their entire lives. However, they will not gain entry into the New Jerusalem. Those who belong to this group are recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. Number 6. How the New Heaven Arrives According to the scripture, the occurrence of a new heaven and a new earth will take place after the thousand-year reign of Christ, also known as the Millennium. The vision mentioned in the scripture describes the disappearance of the first heaven and the first earth with no sea to be found. Revelation 21.1 New American Standard Bible Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. A new world now unfolds before us. In the concept of the new earth, we envision not just a new state for souls, but also for their physical bodies. This world wasn't freshly created, rather it's been newly revealed and is now inhabited by those who rightfully inherit it. In this new heaven and earth, there will be no distinction between them. The bodies of the saints will be transformed into a spiritual and heavenly form suitable for their pure and radiant dwellings. The old world with all its troubles and turmoil has passed away to make room for this new beginning. The Apostle witnessed a new world where the holy city, the New Jerusalem, descended from heaven. This New Jerusalem symbolizes the Church of God in its new and perfected state, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. It gleams with perfection in wisdom and holiness, deserving to bask in the full glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. The new heavens and earth will stand apart from the millennium era as they replace the old, cursed creation. No accursed thing will exist there. However, the throne of God and the Lamb will be present, and His servants will worship Him. Revelation 22.3, New American Standard Bible. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His bondservants will serve Him. 
Throughout the scriptures, the concept of a new earth, complete with a brand new atmosphere and sky, is a recurring theme that has been mentioned by numerous prophets. This notion of a new heaven and new earth is not limited to any one particular section of the Bible, but can be found in both the Old and New Testaments. It has been a source of inspiration and hope for many. Isaiah 65, 17 and 18, New American Standard Bible. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for gladness. 2 Peter 3, 12 and 13, Amplified Bible. The term heaven holds different meanings in the Bible, used in three distinct contexts. The first heaven refers to the atmosphere encircling the earth, commonly known as the blue sky. The second heaven denotes the vast expanse of outer space, often observed as the night sky. Lastly, the third heaven represents the realm where God dwells in divine glory. Regarding the notion of new heaven and new earth, the term new in this context originates from the ancient Greek word kain, indicating a fresh or renewed character rather than simply something recent in time. The forthcoming heaven and earth aren't just the next iterations, but rather superior versions of their predecessors, given that the initial earth has already passed away. It's crucial to understand that the new heaven and earth aren't merely replicas of the old ones. Jesus' assertion that while heaven and earth will fade away, his word will endure eternally underscores this point. Isaiah 65, 17 contains a prophetic declaration from God regarding the creation of a new heaven and earth. The ancient Hebrew word bara used for create in this verse signifies bringing something into existence out of nothing rather than reusing existing material. While some interpret the concept of newness as a spiritual and moral transformation, there also appears to be a physical alteration as indicated by the absence of the sea a new heaven and a new earth. This chapter marks the end of the history of time and the beginning of the history of eternity. 2 Peter 3, 7 through 13, New American Standard Bible. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly people. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be discovered. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will melt with intense heat? But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. God, therefore, will dissolve the old universe and make it new by means of fire. Many equate the renewal that Jesus spoke about with this event, the making of the new heavens and the new earth. Our hope. The hope of the believer is in an inheritance that will not fade away. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5, New American Standard Bible. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Number seven, it is called a city. Heaven is called a city, but as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, indeed, and has readied a city for them. Hebrew 11.16, New American Standard Bible. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, 
for he has prepared a city for them. Throughout the world, there are countless beautiful cities, yet none seem to surpass the one we call home at the end of our journeys. In the book of Revelation, specifically chapters 21 and 22, the word city appears 11 times. This city is depicted as the dwelling place of God and his people. It's not a metaphorical expression, but a description of an actual physical place. Since we will inhabit our resurrected bodies in this city, it necessitates a physical existence. It's not merely a dream or an abstract concept. It's a tangible place. The heavenly Jerusalem is indeed a city. This concept isn't new. It traces back to the time of Abraham. Hebrews 11 mentions Abraham's quest for a city whose builder and maker was God. Similarly, Hebrews 12 instructs Hebrew Christians to come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Paul also refers to this city in his letter to the Galatians, calling it the Jerusalem above, while Revelation 3.12 identifies it as the city of my God and the new Jerusalem. Still to come, this city will endure, it won't perish. For here we have no lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come, not realm of God. In the Bible, there are references to three heavens. The first heaven is the Earth's atmosphere, the second is the celestial bodies such as the sun, moon, and stars, and the third heaven is where God resides. It's important to note that sin has affected only the first and second heavens, but not God's realm. Thus, God's domain remains perfect, while the physical universe needs to be renewed. As a result, it's the first and second heavens that will be transformed. Number 8. The Size of the City First and foremost, I'd like to discuss the size of this city with you. Has anyone ever said to you, how on earth is heaven ever going to be big enough for all the Christians from all time to live there? It's going to have to be a big place. So let me impress this upon your mind and heart today. Heaven, this city of God, will be the most incredible place you've ever heard of. In Revelation 21, 15 and 16, the one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city, its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square and its length is as great as the width. And he measured the city with the rod 12,000 stadia. Its length, width and height are equal. One reason many people attempt to spiritualize and dismiss the significance of this city is due to its immense size, surpassing anything imaginable. To grasp its scale, consider this. Each of its walls and the cube itself spans approximately 1,400 to 1,500 miles. The ground floor alone covers a staggering 2,250,000 square miles. To put it in perspective, London covers just 140 square miles. This city is 20 times larger than all of New Zealand, 10 times larger than Germany or France, and 40 times larger than all of England. It dwarfs even India in size. If God reserves his best for last, wouldn't you expect his final creation to be unimaginably spectacular? How could God drop a city of that magnitude out of heaven, one might ask? With the same power that created the world with a mere word, the same power that brought forth creation. And if he promises it in his word, it will come to pass. Now, let's delve into the city's interior for a moment, touching briefly on what John reveals in these two chapters. First and foremost, it's a holy city, as described in verse 2 of chapter 21. Then I, John, saw the holy city. Its primary characteristic is its holiness. The Wycliffe Bible Commentary describes it as follows. A holy city will be one where no lie is spoken in 100 million years, no evil word uttered, no shady dealings discussed, no unclean image seen, no corruption manifested. It will be holy because everyone within it will be holy. Number 9. What Jesus Said About Heaven Jesus mentions heaven approximately 70 times in the book of Matthew alone. Just before Jesus was arrested and crucified, he comforted his disciples by assuring them that despite his imminent death, he would rise again. 
He also promised to return to his Father in heaven to prepare an eternal home for all who believe in him. He said, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. He then promised, I am going there to heaven to prepare a place for you, so that you also may be where I am. John 14, 2 and 3. There will come a day when justice will prevail. Every person has at least two commitments in their foreseeable future, neither of which can be marked in a journal or on a calendar. Hebrews 9.27, Man is destined to die once, and after that to face judgment. The first date is unique for each person, whereas the second date is similar for everyone. There's a clear difference between casual conversation and preaching from the Bible. Biblical preaching always includes a challenge to make a choice. The truth of the Bible isn't merely information to be absorbed passively. It demands action. Jesus' teachings, such as the Sermon on the Mount, concluded with an open invitation to all. While he addressed his followers directly, one can imagine him pausing to look out at the wider crowd, extending a personal invitation to each individual to come and be saved. He earnestly urged them to enter the door of salvation and begin the journey toward heaven. Jesus delineated the two distinct paths available in life. Each person is traveling on a path leading somewhere, a journey we're all undertaking. He encourages us to choose the pathway to heaven over the route to hell. There's no option to remain neutral. A decision must be made. The easy path, the path to hell. Matthew 7:13. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. It's up to you whether or not you go past the broad gate and continue walking along the big road. This gate can be traversed with relative ease. Beyond appears an easy road upon which to travel. In point of fact, Jesus made it clear that many people choose this path when he remarked, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. The hard path, the path to heaven. Matthew 7:14, New American Standard Bible. For the gate is narrow, and the way is constricted that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Jesus cautioned people to stay away from the path that led to destruction, but he also urged them to follow the one that was narrow and led to heaven. Notice how Jesus described access to the hard path in Matthew 7:13, New American Standard Bible. Enter through the narrow gates, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. Imagine trying to enter a packed football stadium through a narrow turnstile where only one person can pass through at a time. This analogy helps us understand how we enter the path to heaven. No one can be saved on behalf of another. The path is challenging, with a narrow gate. On the broad road, people carry their sins with them, but at the narrow gate leading to life, one cannot enter burden with sin. Certain things must be left behind at the entrance, a change of heart regarding sin, known as repentance, and a personal commitment to Jesus Christ. Contrastingly, the road to heaven widens as it progresses, unlike the path to hell, which becomes increasingly crowded. Choosing Jesus as your Savior sets you on a journey of increasing joy, satisfaction, and fulfillment. Heaven is the ultimate destination, and knowing Christ as your Savior is a beautiful experience. Which path have you chosen? The consequence of rejecting Christ is a life sentence in hell, a place of separation from God and all that is good. Those in hell will be excluded from the new heaven and earth, confined alongside the devil, demons, and those who reject their creator. They will endure eternal torment in a lake of fire, filled with anguish and regret for opportunities missed. Revelation 14:11, New American Standard Bible. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Revelation 2010, New American Standard Bible. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. No wonder Jesus spoke with horror of such a fate. 
warning his disciples of the danger and willing to sacrifice himself to save them from it. So, will the entire human race be condemned in that court? Another book was opened, which is the Book of Life. Revelation 2012. Everyone who is named in this book will be found not guilty, freeing them from the consequences of the verdict and the sentence. It is a book that has been around ever since the start of recorded history. It is mentioned in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, but the book of Revelation does so the most frequently. Exodus 32, 32 and 33, New American Standard Bible. But now, if you will forgive their sin, very well. But if not, please wipe me out from your book which you have written. However, the Lord says to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will wipe him out of my book. John 17, 6, New American Standard Bible. I have revealed your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have followed your word. Revelation 21, 27, New American Standard Bible. And nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. How did they qualify for inclusion? They trusted in Christ as their Redeemer. They lived by faith. They trusted and heeded God's words. Their acts were proof of their faith. It's necessary to point out that genuine trust is not a single step, but rather a lengthy journey. The core of believing in a person is to go on believing whatever happens. Faith and faithfulness are exactly the same word in both the Hebrew and the Greek languages. It is possible to fall away from one's faith and shipwreck it. 1 Timothy 1, 19 and 20, New American Standard Bible. Keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith, among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. It's possible for names in the Book of Life to be blotted out, as God made clear to Moses. Exodus 32:33, New American Standard Bible. However, the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will wipe him out of my book. Only the names of those who stay faithful who overcomes all the forces to distrust and disobey will remain until the day the book is finally opened. Number 10, what the Old Testament says about heaven. The Old Testament prophets, Psalms, and the apostles all spoke of heaven inspired by divine guidance from the Holy Spirit. While the Bible may not provide every detail about heaven that we desire, it offers everything we need to know while we're here on earth. We should trust what the Bible says about heaven and find comfort in the promise that we can spend eternity with Jesus Christ in his heavenly abode. If someone asks you about heaven, you can confidently respond. We know that if the earthly tent, body, we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. 2 Corinthians 5.1 What an incredible promise! What a glorious destiny awaits us. Number 11, heaven is a true, tangible place. John 14, heaven is not a metaphysical concept or a mental state. It's a tangible, physical location. Just like Miami, London, and Tokyo, heaven is a real place, not a product of imagination or make-believe. In John 14, Jesus assured his disciples that he was preparing a place for them not a state of mind or an abstract concept. He was preparing a genuine physical place specifically designed for those who have a personal relationship with God. John 14, two through four, New American Standard Bible. In my father's house are many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you because I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I am coming again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you also will be, and you know the way where I am going. First, notice how Jesus refers to his Father's house and how many rooms it contains. Second, note how Jesus uses the word place three times in this short passage. In some languages, the word translated place has been translated as mansions, but the reference was to rooms added to the patriarch's house 
as sons married and brought their wives to live in the extended family compound or estate. Finally, Jesus promises that he will return to get us so that we can be with him. So, if Jesus is true and lives somewhere, we're promised to be with him in that place. Number 12. God the Father is there, and Jesus is on his right hand. The disciples were taught to begin their prayers by addressing our Father in heaven in Jesus' model prayer in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6, 9, New American Standard Bible. Pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Romans 8, 34, New American Standard Bible. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, but rather was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. According to Romans 8, after being crucified and resurrected, Jesus ascended back into heaven and is now interceding for us at the right hand of God. When Stephen was stoned in Acts 7, the Bible says he saw heaven open up and Jesus standing at God's right side. Jesus is the only one who has ever been to heaven before being born on earth. As a result, when he speaks of heaven and eternity, he does so with authority and conviction. Number 13, all the believers are there. Hebrews 12 talks about the church of the firstborn. This is a reference to Jesus' church, which is the firstborn of God. All believers who have put their confidence and trust in Jesus Christ make up the church of Jesus Christ. Following on from the report concerning the church of the firstborn, the author of Hebrews claims that all believers' names are written in heaven. Hebrews 12.23, New American Standard Bible. To the General Assembly and Church of the Firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the Judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Number 14. There will be people in heaven from all nations. Revelation 5, 9, and 10, New American Standard Bible. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to break its seals, for you were slaughtered and you purchased people for God with your blood from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You have made them into a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. The four living creatures and the 24 elders announce in this great scene around the throne in heaven that only Jesus is worthy to open the seals of the scroll that will disclose these end time events. People from all nations have responded to the gospel and have a position in heaven because of Jesus' sinless sacrifice on the cross. This is a beautiful depiction of God's heart. Heaven will be multi-ethnic, with people from every culture, people, community, and country gathered around God's throne. Number 15. Our names are recorded there. Luke 10, 20. In Luke 10, something really interesting happens. 72 of Jesus' followers were sent out in pairs into the surrounding towns and villages. They were tasked with healing the sick and spreading the gospel of Jesus. The Bible says that when the 72 returned, they were overjoyed and exclaimed, Luke 10, 20, New American Standard Bible. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. All these was the precursor to an assignment trip debrief. And much to their surprise and joy, these early disciples of Jesus discovered that they had control and authority over demons as well. Jesus was swift to issue a warning. He remarked, however, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Luke 10:20. It's like Jesus was saying, as grand as it is that you have power over demons, don't ever forget that the grandest gift you've been given is that your name is written in heaven. Have you ever had the knowledge of going to a conference? You see, having your name written on the list denotes that you're a member of the group. It states that you have the right to participate and join. It states that you took the requisite measures to obtain a conference seat. It states that you meet the entry requirements. The same can be said in heaven. The fact that your name is written there indicates that you belong and have the authority to join and participate as someone who has placed their faith in Jesus. Number 16. We have an inheritance there. 
1 Peter 1, 3 and 4, New American Standard Bible. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. I want you to take a minute and try to imagine that your dad is a wealthy king. And then one day, he comes in and tells you that he's leaving you his whole fortune. Now, that's pretty fun to imagine. I'm willing to bet your heart would begin to beat a little faster, a grin would appear on your face, and you'd become giddy with anticipation about everything that was about to happen. The good news is that your Heavenly Father has given you an everlasting inheritance, which is safely deposited in heaven. That isn't just a fluffy theological notion. What you'll get in eternity far outweighs inheriting a billion dollars. Number 17. Our citizenship is there. Philippians 3.20 In Philippians 3.20, the Apostle Paul says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The sentiment expressed in the old song, This world is not our home, aligns with biblical truth. According to the Bible, we're like pilgrims and nomads journeying through this earthly realm. This understanding should prevent us from becoming too attached to worldly pursuits. Consider this analogy. Just as an American ambassador to Japan may have a temporary residence there but remains a citizen of the United States, it would be treasonous for them to renounce their citizenship. Likewise, for Christians, it's moral treason to live and behave as though we belong to this world. Paul describes believers in 2 Corinthians as ambassadors serving our king while residing in a foreign land. We are citizens of a different kingdom, the heavenly kingdom. As citizens of heaven, we are entitled to rights and blessings simply by virtue of our citizenship. It may be challenging to grasp, but when we trust Christ as our savior, we receive a spiritual passport and heaven becomes our true home. God expects us to live accordingly, representing our heavenly citizenship in all we do. Number 18, specific eternal rewards are given there. Did you know that your actions in this life have an effect on your eternal life? With these words from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus offered wise advice as well as a strong challenge. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6:19 through 21, New American Standard Bible. Jesus reminds us that the things of this world are just temporary. It will eventually wear out, give out, break down, and be discarded. The new car you so desperately want will only last a few years. In less than a year, the new smartphone you've been eyeing will be obsolete. By next fall, the jacket you've been eyeing will be forgotten in the back of your wardrobe. The treasures we keep in heaven, on the other hand, are everlasting and will never decay, rust, or ruin. When you make financial investments, you're putting money away that will be there for me later in life. The same is true of your spirituality. When you make spiritual investments of my time, talents, and treasure in God's kingdom and his purpose, I'm making deposits in heaven that will be waiting for me when I arrive. Number 19. It's the best of earth, only better. The world we currently inhabit is an old earth marred by the effects of sin. However, there's a promise of a new heaven and a new earth that is just as real, physical, and tangible as our current world, but infinitely better. In this new creation, there will be no trace of sin, disease, pollution, or disaster. While our current planet is a precious gift from God, it bears the scars of sin. No scientific or environmental advancement can restore it to its original perfection. While we should certainly be diligent stewards of the planet God has entrusted to us, our ultimate hope should not rest in this world. God is preparing for us a new heaven and a new earth that surpasses anything we can imagine. This future reality far exceeds the limitations and flaws of our present world. Number 20. Sin, death, and sorrow 
are absent. Revelation 21.4, New American Standard Bible. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Heaven will be great because a few things won't be there. In Revelation 21.4, John says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. There's no place on this earth where we can evade death's grip. The reality is that we are all terminal. The mortality rate in every community is 100%. None of us are exempt and none will escape. As Ecclesiastes 8.8 states, none of us can hold back our spirit from departing. None of us has the power to prevent the day of our death. So the question isn't so much if, but when. The Bible tells us that the Lord has predetermined our days, though the exact timing remains unknown to us. While we may not know the number of our days, one certainty is that death awaits us all. If there's any doubt about our destination after death, I urge you to seek answers. Unlike Earth, heaven will be vastly different, free from sin, death, and sorrow. Imagine a place devoid of cemeteries or funeral homes where there's no need for rehab or recovery clinics. This is the place God is preparing for us right now. Number 21, four things angels do in heaven. Angels in heaven serve God. They serve God, Psalm 103, 20, Revelation 22, 9. The psalmist lets us know that the angels serve the Lord. Psalm 103, 20, bless the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his commandments, obeying the voice of his word. Through the course of history, people have repeatedly fallen into the trap of worshiping angels rather than God. When John makes the error of worshiping an angel, the angel let him know the truth. Revelation 22, 8 and 9, New American Standard Bible. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. And he said to me, Do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brothers, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book worship God. As before in Revelation 19.10, John was overwhelmed and bowed before an angel in worship. In the same way, the angel reminded John that only God is to be worshipped and that they were both players on the same team, along with all who keep the words of this book. No created being should ever be worshipped. This is in contrast with Jesus who receives the worship of angels and of men. The second job of heavenly angels is to attend to God and take missions in heaven. Angel Gabriel, delivering good news to Zacharias in the New Testament, said he was in the very presence of God. Luke 1.19, New American Standard Bible. The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. Zacharias doubts the efficacy of Angel Gabriel's news and the angel stops his mouth by asserting his authority. Angels have sometimes refused to tell their names, as to Manoah and his wife, but his angel readily saith, I am Gabriel, which signifies the power of God or the mighty one of God, intimating that the God who bade him say this was able to make it good. He is Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God an immediate attendant upon the throne of God. Angels also appear before God. Job 1.6, New American Standard Bible. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. This reveals the scene in heaven, unseen to Job and others on earth, but absolutely real nonetheless. The story of Job can really only be properly understood by taking into account what happened in heaven and by having more than an earthly perspective. The third job of heavenly angels is accompanying us to heaven. Believers who die will be escorted safely into heaven by the angels according to the Bible. Two very different men were described by Jesus in one of his parables. 
There was a rich man who lived only for himself and ignored both God and others. This wealthy man had access to everything good in life. Lazarus, on the other hand, was not only poor but also covered in sores. He yearned to eat the crumbs that had fallen from the rich man's table, but all he got were dogs licking his wounds. The contrast between the two men could not be more pronounced. From a purely earthly standpoint, the rich man was the clear victor, but Jesus was about to give them a bird's eye view of the world. Despite the fact that the two men had almost nothing in common in life, they both experienced an event that all humans face, death. After death, however, each experienced a complete reversal of fortune. When the poor man died, the angels took him to Abraham's side, or bosom, an idiom for heaven. But when the rich man died, he went to Hades to suffer torment. Many people believe there is no such thing as an afterlife. They argue that when people die, they simply cease to exist. God's angels are real, even though we may not see them or even know they're there. If they protect us now, can't they also be trusted to safeguard our journey to heaven? Of course. In addition to escorting believers to heaven, angels perform God's work. Scripture confirms this. The Lord is the God of all comfort, and He employs His heavenly army of angels to bring warnings of danger, tidings of joy, and messages of peace. The Bible calls them ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. Hebrews 1.14 Believing that God will send these angelic comforters to escort us out of this world and into the next should give great peace to our souls. The Bible says, The Lord shall preserve your soul. He shall preserve your going out and your coming in. Psalm 121, 7 and 8, NKJV. We must remember, however, that while God's angels provide comfort and protection, even at death, it is God who dispatches them and we are not to worship them. The hosts of heaven stand at attention as we make our way from earth to glory and Satan's attacks are no match for God's angels. So don't be afraid. God is for you. He has committed his angels to wage war in this conflict of the ages and they will win the victory. The Apostle Paul has said in Colossians 2.15, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. Victory over the flesh, the world, and the devil is ours now. The angels are here to help, and they're prepared for any emergency. Their fourth duty, they worship God. John reveals it to us in the book of Revelation. One of the basic descriptions of angels is this, they worship. In the book of Revelation, we learn about the activities angels perform in heaven. Angels in heaven are saturated with the adoration of God as a consequence of the Lamb's redemptive work. Revelation 5, 8 through 13, New American Standard Bible. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to break its seals. For you were slaughtered, and you purchased people for God with your blood from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You have made them into a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voices of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slaughtered to receive power, wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory, and blessing. And I heard every created thing which is in heaven, or on the earth, or under the earth, or on the sea, and all the things in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be the blessing, the honor, the glory, and the dominion forever and ever. In Revelation 4, 9 and 10, the angels prompted the elders into worship. The elders seem to be prompting the angels here. There's a wonderful cycle in heaven with the angels and elders encouraging one another to praise more and more. Angels are worship leaders. There are images of angels on some altars in the great cathedrals. In this art, angels are portrayed offering incense, that is, the people's prayers. 
Praying, interceding, and worshiping are the responsibilities of angels. Angels are ministers in a story about God. Fascination with angel messengers can creep dangerously close to idolatry. Through the course of history, people have repeatedly fallen into the trap of worshiping angels rather than God. In point of fact, the Apostle Paul cautioned the church in Colossae against worshiping angels. The Apostle John needed to be told not to worship an angel when one appeared to him. Angels worship God. Angels that don't summon us to see God are not doing God's work. Rather, they are the rebellious, bad angels often called demons or evil spirits. Revelation 7, 11, and 12, New American Standard Bible. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. As the incredible multitude glorifies God, the others in heaven are compelled to merge their voices in praise. Around the throne, all created beings join in. As these other beings hear the adoration the great multitude brings to God, they see more clearly the power and wisdom and majesty of God. They can worship God all the more by witnessing the salvation he brought to the incredible multitude. David, as a prophet, also reveals what the angels in heaven do in Psalm 148, 1 and 2, New American Standard Bible. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly armies. The company of faithful angels is like a great army, all his hosts. Other angelic beings fell because they would not properly honor God. Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, New American Standard Bible. How you have fallen from heaven, you star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who defeated the nations. But you said in your hearts, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Nevertheless, you will be brought down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. Isaiah also shows us this. Isaiah describes his intense vision of God's heavenly court in that biblical chapter. The prophet specifically saw God seated on an exalted throne surrounded by flying angels known as seraphim. Isaiah 6, 1 through 7, New American Standard Bible. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim were standing above him, each having six wings. With two, each covered his face, and with two, each covered his feet, and with two, each flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe to me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your guilt is taken away, and atonement is made for your sin. Each set of the seraphim's wings serves a different purpose. One set covers the face, denoting reverence and awe, and acts as protection from the radiance of God's glory. Another set is used for flying, assisting in their swift servitude, and the third set is used to cover the seraphim's feet humbly concealing their unworthiness while in God's holy presence. God created seraphim as sinless creatures, but they're not to be confused with God. The seraphim, in fact, spend their days and nights worshiping God for his holiness. During this never-ending worship, they exclaim, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. The importance of the seraphim's close proximity to God, combined with their revelatory praise, cannot be overstated. When the seraphim say, the whole earth is full of his glory, they are giving a first-hand account of what they see from heaven's apex. 
The seraphim repeatedly proclaimed God's supreme holiness and glory in Isaiah's vision. In God's presence, the seraphim do not address God directly, but rather call out to one another. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. To be holy means to be distinguished and revered. This thrice invocation of the word holy to describe God's sacred nature appears only twice in the Bible, both times by angels to someone transported in a vision to God's throne. The other passage that contains this thrice invocation of God's holiness is found in Revelation 4, 8, which also refers to six winged angels surrounding God's heavenly throne and constantly proclaiming God's glory. In Revelation 4, John's vision of God's throne was similar to that of Isaiah. In reverence and awe of the Holy One, living creatures gathered around the throne cried out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, Revelation 4.8. Revelation 4.8, New American Standard Bible. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. The book of Hebrews also shows us this point. Hebrews 1.6, New American Standard Bible. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. Deuteronomy 32.43 lets us know that Jesus is superior as he is the object of divine worship. He is not an angelic worshiper. He is worshiped by the angels. However, he does not worship among them. Revelation 5 provides a peek at the angelic worship of Jesus. Deuteronomy 32.43, New American Standard Bible. Rejoice, you nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will return vengeance on his adversaries and will atone for his land and his people. Hebrews paints Jesus as the ultimate revelation of God, superior to the prophets or the angels. Jesus is the exact representation of God and has a position above everyone. Hebrews 1.3, New American Standard Bible. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus displayed his strength in creation and salvation. He is the strongest leader and even the angels follow him. Angels serve as a wonderful example for Christians to follow in terms of obeying the Lord and giving praise to his name. To tell the truth, we can join the worship of the angels in praising God and say with the psalmist, Psalm 150, 6, New American Standard Bible. Everything that has breath shall praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Revelation 7:11, New American Standard Bible. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Number 22. Five men that saw the throne of God. Isaiah. Isaiah had a vision of the King of Kings. According to John 12, the king he saw was actually the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah was a prophet known for his righteousness. His encounter gave him a deeper understanding of God's magnificence and power. As a result, he was able to speak God's word with extraordinary boldness and authority. Ezekiel. It's hard to put into words what Ezekiel saw as he looked upon God's magnificent throne. As a messenger of God, he was used to bringing messages, visions, and revelation to his people. Daniel. Daniel lived in captivity in Babylon along with his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The more he knew about God, the more he declared the truth to kings without fear or favor. One of such revelations that came to Daniel was the awesome view of the Creator's throne. Daniel's words help us to understand God's dominion, authority, and power so that we can approach Him with reverence. This picture also describes how God is the God of all flesh and the fathers of everyone regardless of our language or nation. Stephen 
Stephen is first mentioned in the book of Acts of the Apostles. At that time, he was serving as one of seven deacons in the early church, which had been chosen by the apostles to provide members of the community who were less fortunate with food and other forms of charity assistance. In addition to this, he was the first Christian martyr. He was executed by stoning for proclaiming that Jesus was the Christ. At the point where he was stoned, he also had a vision about heaven's throne. Acts 7, 51 through 60, New American Standard Bible. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, and you have now become betrayers and murderers of him. You who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. Now when they heard this, they were infuriated and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they shouted with loud voices and covered their ears and rushed at him with one mind. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him and the witnesses laid aside their cloaks at the feet of a young man named Saul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. It's amazing that even though Stephen was being terribly persecuted, one of the last things he saw before his death was the glorious throne of his father, and he was actually eager to go there despite his pain. This should bring comfort to all believers because God's court is a home for all those that believe in Jesus. John, the revelation of Jesus Christ was given to John so that he would show his servants what must soon come to pass as the end of days draw closer. God made it known by sending his angel to John on the island of Patmos. As he received the vision about God's end time plan, he was also taken into the throne room of God to see marvelous things in the heavens. Revelation 4, New American Standard Bible. After these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and someone was sitting on the throne. He who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and upon the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion, the second creature like a calf. The third creature had a face like that of a man and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne, and they will worship him who lives forever and ever, and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. If not for the revelation that people like John, Stephen, Daniel, Ezekiel, and Isaiah had about the throne room of God, we would not have a complete picture of God's majestic courtroom. Thankfully, even if we never have a supernatural divine vision about God's throne room, 
he still invites us to come before him by faith in Hebrews 4.16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The Bible tells us that it's a good thing to approach unto God, and this is true for many of us who worship him in truth. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. Psalm 65, 4. However, several people had unforgettable supernatural experiences and visions that actually brought them face to face to God's throne room. No matter the time in history that they belong to, their descriptive words are full of clear images or insights that are constant and consistent from century to century. Getting a glimpse of what God's throne actually looks like left them with so much shock and holy reverence that they returned to tell the story with varying emotions ranging from fear to shock. When a person leaves the place of a divine encounter with the confidence of forgiveness, especially after he just saw how filthy his self-righteousness was before God, he is forever changed. Six things we will do in heaven. Number one, we will worship. What awaits us beyond this life? Imagine a place where every longing is fulfilled, every sorrow erased, and every purpose realized. According to the Bible, heaven is more than just a peaceful place to rest. It is also a busy place where people pray and talk with God. Surrounded by a panorama of spiritual beauty, the heavenly domain is shown in vivid detail as an eternal sanctuary where the heavenly and the redeemed live together in perfect unity. Along with Jesus Christ, God is present in every aspect of life in heaven giving everyone who lives there a deep sense of holiness and awe. The constant worship and service that fill every part of heavenly life make this divine environment even stronger. Along with them are all the holy beings, angels and saved humans, who have served faithfully throughout the ages and are now gathering to praise God forever. All the holy people who have lived on earth will be in heaven with God, Jesus and everyone else. In Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 through 14, in chapter 7, verses 9 through 10, scenes of huge praise with angels and the saved from every country are described. These verses describe an amazing group of people who are united not by past disagreements, but by their love for God, the Creator and Savior. These texts paint a clear picture of a group of people from different backgrounds and languages who come together to worship and adore the Lamb and the one who sits on the throne. The different kinds of people who are worshiping show how Christ's mission to save the world has affected everyone and how the prophecy that every tribe, tongue, and country will recognize his rule has come true. The images are strong and show a constant, changing celebration of God's glory and kindness. This chapter talks about the joyful worship in heaven, focusing on Christ's work of redemption and the deep happiness of praise in heaven. It talks about how worship in the heavens can be used as a model for worship on earth changing ritual practices and how people personally pray. By reading stories from the Bible, people can understand the size and depth of worship that goes beyond anything they can experience on earth. Worship is like appreciating God's goodness from the bottom of our hearts. It's not just about following rules or saying nice words. It's about truly feeling that deep love and thanks because we know what God has done for us. Just like we appreciate someone who helps us in a big way, we should feel that same strong thankfulness to God every single day. The scenes in Revelation are a strong reminder of how Christ's sacrifice saved people of all races and languages. This openness not only shows how big God's love is, but it also shows how the gospel can change people and bring them together under a banner of faith. This openness to everyone stresses how Christ's sacrifice breaks down barriers on earth and brings everyone together under the banner of his love. Plus, the praise in heaven is even more amazing and grand because angels are there. Their high standing in worship in heaven comes from the fact that they were God's messengers and servants throughout biblical history. The beings in this group have been with God and served him throughout time. They each bring something special to the heavenly chorus 
and their purity and devotion make prayer more powerful. Their relationships with humans, which are marked by shared worship and service, show a fuller picture of God's kingdom in which everything praises Him. When angels and humans gather together, it shows that their lives are peaceful and focused on God's glory. This chapter's goal is to give you a better idea of what prayer in heaven is like by looking at these stories from the Bible. It shows how the consistency, variety, and intensity of prayer in heaven serve as a standard for believers on earth. It looks at how people constantly praise and worship God's traits, like His justice, mercy, wisdom, and love. By understanding these dynamics, we can bring aspects of heavenly worship into their daily lives. This creates a culture of worship that goes beyond church settings and into people's personal and social lives. By reading these descriptions, we are encouraged to eagerly look forward to the worship in heaven and to include parts of that worship in their everyday lives as a way to get ready for eternity. Exploring how worship is done in heaven not only excites us about our future afterlife, it also enriches our spiritual life today, encouraging us to adopt the continuous, joyful way of worshiping God seen in heaven. Looking into how prayer is shown in the Bible doesn't just get us ready for what comes next. It strengthens and deepens our connection with God instantly. Heaven, as described in the Bible, is not merely an ethereal concept, but a tangible promise of eternal joy and fulfillment. Revelation chapters 21 through 22 gives us a clear image of heaven, especially focusing on the New Jerusalem, a place where God's presence and unmatched beauty are central. In this video, we will look at six amazing things we'll do in heaven. In Luke chapter 23, verse 43, Jesus declared, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. The word Jesus used for paradise is paradisios, which means a park that is specifically an Eden, place of future happiness, paradise. Paradisios is the Greek word taken from the Hebrew word pardes, which means a park, forest, orchard, strongs. Jesus said, Today you shall be with me in paradisios, not in nephili, which is Greek for in clouds. The point is that Jesus picked and used the word for a park, not just any park, but the paradise of God or park of God. Revelation chapter 2 verse 7, which for us will be a place of future happiness. Does this sound like a boring place? When you think of a park, do you think of boredom? Number two, we will fellowship and serve God. Jesus said, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Matthew chapter 4 verse 10. It's interesting to note that Jesus did not say praise and serve. Even the briefest examination of the word praise in the Bible quickly shows it's a verbal thing and is for the most part singing. Worship, however, is from the heart. Worship manifests itself in praise. Serving God is worship, and scripture is clear we will serve God in heaven. We are unable to fully serve God in this life due to sin, but in heaven, every curse will no longer be. We will not be under the curse of sin any longer, so everything we do will be worship in heaven. We will never be motivated by anything other than our love for God. Everything we do will be out of our love for God, untainted by our sin nature. God's word says we won't have to be in his paradise alone. For now, in this time of imperfection, we see in a mirror dimly, a blurred reflection, a riddle, an enigma, but then, when the time of perfection comes, we will see reality face to face. Now I know in part, just in fragments, but then I will know fully, just as I have been fully known by God. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. This means that we will not only know our friends and family, we will fully know them. In other words, there is no need for secrets in heaven. There is nothing to be ashamed of. There is nothing to hide. We will have eternity to interact with. After these things I looked, and this is what I saw, a vast multitude which no one could count, gathered from every nation and from all the tribes and peoples and languages of the earth, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, Christ, dressed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. No wonder heaven will be a place of infinite learning. Just getting to know everyone will take eternity. Heaven is shown to be more than just a place to worship God all the time. It's also a place where people can get along perfectly and serve others with purpose. 
Here, the divine plan for relationships is fully fulfilled, with none of the flaws caused by sin and the fall. Here, relationships are clean, free from the sin and flaws that make it hard for people to get along with each other on earth. Believers' souls reach the highest level of communion with both each other and God in this holy place. They feel a closeness and togetherness that is beyond what we can understand on earth. We will be able to fully connect with God and other Christians in heaven. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 through 23, this is called coming to the heavenly Jerusalem, which is a happy gathering of angels and perfected good people. These verses stress how entering heaven changes people, where human limitations fall away and spiritual truths are fully accepted. The Bible uses beautiful language to show how different the communities on earth are from the communities in heaven, which will last forever and be perfect. A metaphor for the perfect community of religion, where God's people live together in peace and harmony, is the heavenly Jerusalem. This is mostly about the amazing fellowship and meaningful work we will have when we serve God all day and night. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 15, the phrase, serving God day and night, refers to a life of dedicated care that is free from weariness and burden. People say that this service will never end and that every action and moment is filled with worship and meaning. This service is an honor and a way for those who have been saved to show their love and thanks to God. That kind of service doesn't come from feeling like you have to, but from a heart that has been changed by God's kindness. This service has many parts, such as worship, taking care of heavenly tasks, and maybe even roles that we can't fully understand from our earthly point of view. These duties probably go beyond what we can imagine. They involve every person in important tasks that use their God-given skills and wants in a way that is in perfect harmony with God's will. Every believer's gift and callings are continued and fully realized in the presence of God through this work. It is not just a duty, it is something that deeply pleases the soul and makes everyone who does it happy and satisfied. It is also said that the unity between Christians in heaven is much better than the best relationships on earth. Imagine a community where everyone gets along and acts with selfless love and deep understanding. There are no walls between people like the ones below. In heavenly company, there is no miscommunication, jealousy, or conflict. Instead, there is pure love filled with divine grace that binds everyone in the heavenly community together. We will feel a strong sense of unity that mirrors the eternal and perfect balance within the Trinity. In the same way the Holy Trinity shows love, respect, and obedience among themselves, so does this perfect friendship serve as a direct reflection of their interaction. Having this understanding of fellowship and service to God means that the things that make heaven great should guide and inspire how we treat each other in our churches and neighborhoods. It encourages us to develop traits of heavenly service and fellowship in the relationships and church activities we already have. By thinking about and looking forward to the perfect community of heaven, we are encouraged to build a strong community here on earth that will reflect the love and togetherness that will be present in our eternal home. Knowing these not only gives us hope for the future, but it also motivates us to use what we have learned in the present. This will improve our spiritual lives and our involvement in the church and community. We should aim to make the world a better place by imagining the beauty and peace of heaven. In this way, we will strive to be pure and loving every day, just like heaven. Number three, we will explore the wonders of heaven. Heaven is described as a park, the paradise of God. Imagine a perfect park filled with beautiful landscapes, trees, rivers, and endless places to explore. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you blessed of my father, you favored of God appointed to eternal salvation. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Matthew chapter 25, verse 34. The book of Revelation starts with an amazing vision of heaven, which we see as the ultimate place for every faithful believer of Christ. Heaven is key in understanding the final events according to the Bible. We see it as both the promise and the final step of our Christian belief. Even as the Bible is inspired by prophecy and godly visions, we are presented with a clear and inspiring picture of life after death that encourages us. John's revelation not only gives a glimpse into the future, but also brings hope and drive, supporting our spiritual journey. 
Revelation in the New Jerusalem. The book of Revelation paints a beautiful picture of heaven, with the New Jerusalem as its main center. This heavenly city is not just a figure of speech. It is shown to be a real beautiful place that is more beautiful than anything on earth. The details of the city in the sky that John saw are very specific so that we can understand how holy and magnificent it is. The account of the city is full of unique symbolic details, like gates made of pearls and streets made of gold, which show both how valuable the city is and how well it was made. People often see these things as signs of God's perfect nature and His promise to repay those who are faithful. It is a world of perfect beauty, and the presence of God has been called the place where God's glory shines on everything. God's constant presence, shown by never-ending light, emphasizes the eternal happiness and peace that defines the heavenly world. Since God's glory is enough light, there is no night and no need for the sun or moon. This shows that the city is holy and always peaceful. There will no longer exist anything that is cursed, because sin and illness and death are gone and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve and worship him with great awe and joy and loving devotion. They will be privileged to see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Revelation chapter 22, verses 3 through 4. They'll see his face and have his name on their foreheads, as Adam and Eve did when they were first together in the Garden of Eden. This passage talks about the restoration of a direct and unmediated contact with God, these lines sum up the closeness and reward that awaits those who are faithful, direct access to God, which was taken away in Eden but is given back in the New Jerusalem. Putting God's name on the foreheads of His servants shows that there is a strong connection between the Creator and His creation that can't be broken. There will be no more tears, death, or pain there, just like God promised in Eden that everything would be okay and that people would always be able to talk to God. As predicted in the Bible, the end of pain and the keeping of God's promises in the New Jerusalem show that good will win in the end over evil. This is an amazing picture of heaven and how it promises to be the most beautiful and glorious place in the world. As a reminder of the eternal inheritance that awaits, the picture is meant to not only comfort, but also inspire and lift the spirit of every believer in Christ. Each picture of heaven is full of meanings that are meant to strengthen the Christian faith across generations. Through this study, we will look at different interpretations and insights that help us understand the Bible better and gain a deeper knowledge of what the Apostle John meant when he had his visions. We can better understand our faith's history and prophecies, which makes our spiritual lives more meaningful. Studying the specific representations in Revelation helps us understand the importance of heaven better. It shows the end of God's plan to save humanity and achieves the greatest desire of every believer in Christ. Thinking about these messages from God, we are motivated to look at our own spiritual growth and the everlasting rewards that come with it. This strengthens our faith and dedication. Number four, we will rule. The Bible also tells us that we will reign with Christ. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. We will share in his glory and authority, serving as his representatives in the new heaven and new earth. Whatever we will be doing, we can be sure it will be wonderful beyond our imaginations. The joy, peace, and fulfillment we will experience in heaven will be far greater than anything we can comprehend in this life. Ruling with Christ is a deep restoration and elevation of the original commandment that God gave to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. In heaven, this duty is not only reinstated, but it is also expanded to include parts of divine government that go beyond our control over the world. This divine right isn't just a return to the role that was originally meant for humans. It's actually an improvement on that role in the framework of eternal life. As a result, it adds a spiritual responsibility that fits perfectly with God's will and His big plan for the universe. The texts describe a future in which the saints not only live in a new paradise, but also help run it. This shows that God has a lot of faith in His people. The transition from dominion over the earth to dominion over the heavens signifies a move from mastery over the physical to mastery over the spiritual realm, including the entirety of creation. 
The increase doesn't just make us stronger in a physical sense, but also boosts our spiritual importance, making us more in tune with what God's plan has in store for us. With this increased power, there's a greater duty to lead in a way that mirrors Christ's character, showing fairness and wisdom. It shows the process from the beginning to completion, where we reach our highest beauty and go beyond it. He who overcomes the world through believing that Jesus is the Son of God, I will grant to him the privilege to sit beside me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down beside my Father on his throne. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. According to the scripture, we will rule with Christ and share his power and glory. These texts talk about a way of running things where Christ shares his kingly power with us and makes us co-heirs to his rule. These stresses that we share glory and power with Christ, which means we are both responsible for running the universe. This is based on a close relationship with Christ, which leads to a common goal for God's kingdom. It isn't just a symbolic act. It's a real job that requires duty, wisdom, and fairness. This chapter talks about the great honor and duty of ruling with Christ, which is what we were made to do. It stresses that the role is both an honor and a big responsibility that is given to people who follow Christ's teachings and show what kind of person he was. It talks about the implications of what it means to share in Christ's reign. With this, we are able to look at how the shared power is both a reward for being faithful in God's original plan for his people. Sharing power with Christ isn't just a way to get more respect. It's an important part of God's plan to fix everything through Christ's guidance. This will also include how this rule is based on wisdom, justice, and mercy, and how every judgment and choice is a reflection of Christ's character. The duties that come with ruling with Christ pushes us to develop traits like love, humility, and honesty, which are all important for godly leadership. Those who want to be a part of Christ's government must have these qualities in a heart that is in line with God's plans. They must also live a life that shows the gospel the thought of ruling with Christ also drives us to stay true to our faith and behavior because we know our future part in the new heaven and new earth will be important and have a big effect. We are called to live as if we will one day be kings and queens of God's kingdom. We should develop a servant-hearted, Christ-centered leadership style, just like Jesus did while he was on earth. We get ready for our future duties by working on these leadership skills. Living this way ensures that we are prepared to rule with Christ over the new heaven and new earth. The promise of ruling with Christ not only makes us look forward to our future, but it also glorifies God by carrying out his perfect plan for humanity, which includes saving us and giving us a better place in his eternal kingdom. Being co-rulers with Christ demonstrates how much God trusts and loves us. We see that this is all part of his plan to create a world where his will is perfectly carried out by his restored and saved children. This gives us a full picture of our coming reign with Christ, which fills us with great expectations, prepares us, and makes us more determined to live by God's kingdom rules right now. The huge duty and honor of this promise give us a powerful picture of how to live and serve, encouraging us to align our lives now with the roles we will play in eternity. Number five, we will work. In heaven, we will worship, fellowship, serve, and we will work. This idea might surprise some, as many think of heaven as a place of rest and relaxation. However, the Bible gives us a clear picture that work will be a part of our heavenly life. In Isaiah chapter 65, verses 21 through 23, we read about the new heavens and the new earth. They will build houses and live in them. They will plant vineyards and eat the fruit. They will not build and another occupy. They will not plant and another eat the fruit. For as the lifetime of a tree, so will be the days of my people and my chosen people will fully enjoy and long make use of the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain or bear children for disaster. For they are the descendants of those blessed by the Lord and their offspring with them. Isaiah 65 verses 21 through 23. This passage shows us that our work in heaven will be fulfilling and enjoyable. Unlike in this world, where work can often feel like toil and struggle due to the curse of sin in heaven, our labor will be blessed and satisfying. 
The curse placed on work because of sin will be lifted. Work will no longer be burdensome or tiresome. Instead, it will be a joyous and rewarding part of our existence in heaven. The Bible also tells us, I am convinced and confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will continue to perfect and complete it until the day of Christ Jesus, the time of his return. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. God's work in us will continue until it is perfected, but this doesn't mean that our own work will end. When we get to heaven, our real work will just be beginning. We will be perfectly equipped to serve and glorify God with all the skills and talents we have developed in this life. Think about how, even now, you find joy and fulfillment in using your skills and talents. Imagine that joy multiplied without any frustration, fatigue, or failure. That's what work in heaven must be like and will be like. Every skill and talent we'll have honed in this life will be put to use in the most fulfilling ways. N.T. Wright, in his book, Surprised by Hope, writes, There will be work to do, and we shall relish doing it. All the skills and talents we have put to God's service in this present life, and perhaps to the interests and likings we gave up because they conflicted with our vocation, will be enhanced and ennobled and given back to us to be exercised to His glory. Heaven will not be a place of idle existence, but a place where we continue to grow and thrive in the work that we do. Our work in heaven will be an expression of our worship and service to God and will be something we look forward to and take great joy in doing. When we consider the work we will do in heaven, it's important to remember that God created us to work and find fulfillment in our work. In Genesis, before sin entered the world, God gave Adam and Eve work to do in the Garden of Eden. They were to tend and keep the garden. This shows us that work in its perfect state is a good and fulfilling part of God's plan for us. In heaven, we will build, create, and cultivate. We will engage in activities that reflect our God-given talents and passions. Our work will not be hindered by the limitations we face on earth. Instead, it will be enhanced and made perfect. Every task we undertake will be meaningful and will contribute to the glory of God and the joy of all who are in heaven. Heaven will be a place of infinite discovery and creativity. We will have the opportunity to explore and develop our abilities in ways we can't even imagine now. Our work will be a continuous act of worship as we serve God and each other with pure hearts and minds. Number six, we will rest. In heaven, we will experience complete joy and peace. There will be no more pain, sorrow, or death and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be death. There will no longer be sorrow and anguish or crying or pain, for the former order of things has passed away. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. The ideas of work and rest are changed and elevated from what they mean on earth to the eternal world. The two problems of being tired and not being able to do things are gone, and their place is a perfectly orchestrated balance. According to the Bible, activities and rest will not cause stress or tiredness in heaven. Instead, they will bring joy and make you feel refreshed. This model of heaven brings back the joyful interaction with creation that God meant from the start. No longer is the curse of work present in this new way of working, as it was in Genesis after the fall. Instead, it goes back to the perfect conditions of the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve worked as part of a happy daily life in perfect harmony with God. The work we do in heaven will be important and satisfying. In Isaiah chapter 65, verses 21 through 23, it says that we will build homes, plant fields, and enjoy the fruits of our labor without having to work hard or suffer bad luck. These verses describe a life where work and its results are exactly aligned, and there is none of the corruption and decay that comes with work on earth. These actions are shown not only as chores, but also as creative and responsible acts that have lasting meaning. No matter how big or small the job is, it is an act of worship and a contribution to the community in heaven. The text talks about a restored world where work isn't frustrating or pointless like it is on earth. There is instead a deep alignment between one's efforts and their results, making sure that all work is directly satisfying and helpful. Along with this satisfying work, we will have a perfect rest. This rest brings total healing on all levels, spiritual, physical, and emotional. It shows how heaven promises to make us whole, 
not just stopping what you're doing. This rest is a state of full peace and happiness. It's a divine rest that reminds us of the holy rest God took on the seventh day of creation. It's a reflection of how sacred rest is, as it's built into the very structure of the world. This rest in heaven is strongly connected to work. Both are parts of a balanced eternal life that honors God and fulfills the soul. In this part, we talk about how work and rest will be able to coexist peacefully and happily. These things fit together so well that it looks like there is a divine order to life that makes everyone happier. The Bible's picture of heaven says that there will be cycles of work and rest that are like how God made us to work and rest. This cyclical pattern makes sure that neither part takes over the other, which supports a good, all-around way of life. In heaven, work makes rest better, and rest makes you ready for work again. It's a perfect circle that keeps happiness and fulfillment going. We who believe in God can learn from the way work and rest coexist in heaven and try to find balance in our own lives. It gives us a holy model that makes us think about how we might be more productive and less productive at the same time. With this, we have hope that our work has meaning when it fits with God's plans and that our rest is healing when it fits with the rhythm God planned. We can live a life that respects God in both action and rest by following this divine example. By looking at these facts about heaven, we are asked to think about how we feel about work and rest and how we can better match our feelings with what the Bible says to promote spiritual health and well-being. Looking into this balance of work and rest not only gives us a taste of how people live in heaven, but it also teaches us how to live a balanced life here and now, one that is spiritually and physically healthy and honors God. The goal is to help us better understand what God meant by work and rest, and to encourage us to live in a way that faithfully expects the perfect continuation of these activities in eternity. Exploring these eternal principles gives us hope that we can apply them to our daily lives, making a rhythm of work and rest that shows our heavenly legacy. Eternal life. One of the most important promises made to us as Christians is eternal life, a life that goes beyond this world and brings us into eternal communion with God. Eternal life is promised to us all over the Bible as the best reward for being faithful and is a sign of hope for us who believe in God's promises. The promise of eternal life is at the heart of our hope and faith as Christians. It comes from the Bible, which speaks of a future devoid of death and decay. These biblical promises offer us a comforting contrast to the temporary nature of life and a solid foundation for our hope. Heaven promises that we will live forever with God. Isaiah chapter 57 verse 15 calls God the high and exalted one who inhabits eternity, which refers to both the fact that he is eternal and the world that he rules over. The depiction of God highlights how far beyond our understanding He is and how His presence assures us of eternal stability. The timeless nature of God not only characterizes who He is, but also molds the future He assures to those of us who follow Him. We are invited into a relationship with God that goes beyond time and change when we align with His eternal nature. Revelation chapter 22 verse 5 says, And there will be no more night. We won't need a lamp or the sun to see because the Lord God will be our light. We will rule forever and ever. The eternal setting of heaven is further emphasized in this verse. Earthly limits or needs vanish as God's perpetual light illuminates everything. Such endless light signifies the ceasing of all darkness in our lives, both physically and mentally. More detailed insights are provided about the concept of eternal life, emphasizing its significance as a divine gift. Eternal life is beyond an unending timeline. It is a summons to embrace the abundant life God envisioned for us from the start. The conversation extends beyond mere eternal existence to include qualities of happiness, peace, and absence of sorrow and pain. These characteristics show how eternal life transforms us. Existence in eternity begins not after death, but the moment we believe in Christ. Revelation discusses the concept of ruling forever with God, showcasing the significance and might we are to hold in our next life. Our reign is described not as a physical dominion, but as a spiritual one, indicating the restoration of our bond with God through Christ. This reign is defined by service, love, and worship, showcasing the true essence of heavenly rule. 
The Bible's guarantee of victory over sin and death gives a deep sense of meaning and destiny to everyone who believes in the gospel. A closer examination of these biblical truths is conducted to better comprehend the essence of living forever with God. This not only predicts the future, but also affects how we live now by promoting a view that focuses on the end times. It motivates us to think about what eternal life means for our own faith and for the church as a whole. A life of holiness, intention, and joy, created by the certainty of our eternal destiny, is upheld. The ultimate aim is to spark more excitement and hope about life after death by blending scripture with real examples. We are encouraged to explore the rich teachings of the Bible on eternal life. By studying the Bible and learning from the history of the church and its teachings about the end times, we gain a deeper understanding of heaven's promise. This study not only strengthens our belief in heaven, but also inspires us to live in a way that honors that future in heaven. Taking this approach helps us grow in faith, understand more, and desire to live fully in Christ, in heaven. We will joyfully worship, work, rest, explore heaven, fellowship, and reign together with Christ. Who are the four creatures in heaven? Ezekiel gives us an insight to the four creatures when he witnesses the throne room of God. The account of the prophecy given by Ezekiel is not a fable from another time and place. He was a real man who lived in a real place and had remarkable visions of God on a real day. The word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel, the priest. God's word not only came to Ezekiel, the priest, but it came remarkably. The meaning of the name Ezekiel can be interpreted as the strength of God or strengthened by God. Ezekiel first noticed a fierce whirlwind coming from the north. Then he saw four living creatures with four eyes, lion, ox, eagle, and man, four wings, straight feet, and hands under its wings. The creatures represent God's attributes seen in creation, his majesty, power, swiftness, and wisdom. The Lord of glory sat on a throne above the firmament. There was a wheel, or rather a wheel within a wheel, beside each living creature. The vision of God's glory came before Ezekiel's call to the prophetic ministry. We see parallels with John in Revelation. However, Ezekiel provides a much more detailed description of the four living creatures. Ezekiel 1, 5 to 9. And in the fire was what looked like four living creatures, in appearance, their form was human, but each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, their feet were like those of a calf and gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings on their four sides they had human hands. All four of them had faces and wings and the wings of one touched the wings of another. Each one went straight ahead, they did not turn as they moved. The four living creatures are also found in Revelation. Revelation 4, 6-9 Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings, and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever. There is no indication that these beings are figurative in the text that describe them. Rather, they are presented as real, actual beings. The four living creatures, literally beings, are a special, exalted order of angelic beings or cherubim. This is made abundantly clear by the proximity of these individuals to the throne of God. Ezekiel 1, 12 to 20. Each one went straight ahead. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go, without turning as they went. The appearance of the living creatures was like burning coals of fire or like torches. Fire moved back and forth among the creatures. It was bright, and lightning flashed out of it. The creatures sped back and forth like flashes and lightning. 
As I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature with its four faces. This was the appearance and structure of the wheels. They sparkled like topaz, and all four looked alike. Each appeared to be made like a wheel intersecting a wheel. As they moved, they would go in any one of the four directions the creatures faced. The wheels did not change direction as the creatures went. Their rims were high and awesome, and all four rims were full of eyes all around. When the living creatures moved, the wheels beside them moved, and when the living creatures rose from the ground, the wheels also rose. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go, and the wheels would rise along with them, because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Revelation chapter 5 verses 6 through 14 explain the functions or responsibilities of the four living creatures. They prostrate themselves before the Lamb, who is Jesus Christ, and offers the same reverence to him as they did the Father, proof positive of the deity of Jesus Christ. Revelation 5, 6 to 9. And there between the throne, with the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb, Christ, standing, bearing scars and wounds, as though it had been slain, with seven horns, complete power, and with seven eyes, complete knowledge, which are the seven spirits of God who have been sent on duty into all the earth. And he came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, Christ, each one holding a harp and a golden bowl full of fragrant incense, which are the prayers of the saints, God's people. And they sang a new song of glorious redemption, saying, Worthy and deserving are you to take the scroll and to take its seals, for you were slain, sacrificed, and with your blood you purchased people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Along with the twenty-four elders, they have harps and golden vials full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. They have harps and golden vials full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they are accompanied by twenty-four elders. In the Old Testament, harps are frequently associated with worship. Harps are also associated with prophecy. The purpose of the four living creatures also has to do with declaring the holiness of God and leading in worship the adoration of God. Additionally, the four living creatures play a role in the execution of God's justice in some fashion. These beings are an exalted order of angels whose purpose is primarily that of worship. Revelation 19.4 the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who was seated on the throne, and they cried, Amen, Hallelujah. Later on, Ezekiel was able to determine that these extraordinary beings were cherubim, which are angels that surround God and possess their own distinct power and glory. Before his fall, Satan was among the cherubim covering God's throne. Ezekiel 28 14 to 16. You were the anointed cherub who covers and protects, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire, sparkling jewels. You were blameless in your ways, from the day you were created until unrighteousness and evil were found in you. Through the abundance of your commerce, you were internally filled with lawlessness and violence, and you sinned. Therefore I have cast you out as a profane and unholy thing from the mountain of God. And I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Since the Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God among Israel, Yahweh was sometimes called He who dwells between the cherubim. 1 Samuel 4.4 4. So the people sent men to Shelah, and they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty, who was enthroned between the cherubim, and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. The Appearance of the Living Creatures Ezekiel 1, 10-14 Regarding the form and appearance of their faces, they each had the face of a man in front, and each had the face of a lion on the right side, and the face of an ox on the left side. All four also had the face of an eagle, at the back of their heads. Such were their faces. Among the living beings there was something that looked like burning coals of fire, 
like torches moving back and forth among the living beings. The fire was bright and lightning was flashing from the fire, and the living beings moved rapidly back and forth like flashes of lightning. In John's vision of heaven, there appeared to be four different creatures. Since the beginning of time, students of the Bible, students in general, and artists have been inspired by these four different faces. The cherubim are a group of celestial beings created by God. They are the first of the angelic hierarchy to appear in the Bible, immediately following Adam and Eve's fall from grace. Genesis 3 records the events in the Garden of Eden, having violated God's commandment not to partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it would have been likely for Adam and Eve to reach out their hands and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. As a result, they were forced to leave their earthly paradise. But what would have stopped Adam from going back to the garden and disobeying God again? The answer is given in this verse. What a terrible situation it would have been if Adam had eaten of the tree of life and so have been perpetually established in his fallen state. God sent a contingent of glorious and trusted cherubim to guard access to the tree to prevent that. We don't know Adam's reaction to witnessing those glorious cherubim for the first time in human history. Perhaps all, fright and wonder, are all emotions that come to mind. Adam realized that his transgression had cut him off from the company and presence of a holy God. Oddly enough, the next occurrence of the cherubim in the Bible involves recovering what was lost. In Exodus 25, Moses was given specific and detailed instructions on how to make several articles of furniture that would be used in the tabernacle. The Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat, where God promised to meet and commune with Moses, were the first to be detailed. What did God want to go over or on top of the Mercy Seat? He chose representations of the cherubim in gold. What an awesome sight that must have been, the cherubim associated with the very presence of God. From those two sources in the Bible, it appears as though the cherubim's major responsibility may be to declare man's sinfulness and protect the presence of God from sinful men. As much as Adam yearned to return to the Garden of Eden, the cherubim reminded him that he had broken God's law. The high priest of Israel would be allowed into the Holy of Holies once a year to gaze upon the mercy seat. I'm sure he must have felt on each occasion, I don't belong here in the holy presence of God, for I am a sinner. Cherubim are real and powerful beings. However, the cherubim in the Bible were often representative of heavenly things. They were integrated into the design of the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle at God's command. Ezekiel 10, 8-14 Under the wings of the cherubim could be seen what looked like human hands. Their entire bodies, including their backs, their hands and their wings, were completely full of eyes, as were their four wheels. The cherubim are shown in Ezekiel 10 as having not only wings and hands, but also being full of eyes, encompassed by wheels within wheels. However, Ezekiel also paints a gloomy tone in chapter 10, and the cherubim provide the hint. The prophet presents his vision that prophesizes the destruction of Jerusalem. In Ezekiel 9.3, the Lord has descended from his throne above the cherubim to the threshold of the temple. In the calm before the storm, we see the cherubim stationed on the south side of the sanctuary. Being stationed in a position toward the city, they witness the beginning of the gradual withdrawal of God's glory from Jerusalem. The fluttering of their wings indicates immensely important events to follow. While Ezekiel 10 is difficult to understand, one point comes across clearly. The cherubim are associated with God's splendor. This chapter is one of the Bible's most cryptic, yet evocative passages about God's grandeur, and it involves angelic beings. It should be read with care and prayer. Few other chapters in the Bible give the reader a feeling of God's greatness and glory, while the seraphim and cherubim are members of distinct hierarchies and are shrouded in mystery in the Bible. They have one thing in common. They constantly glorify God. 
But as wonderful as angelic and heavenly beings are, they pale in comparison to our heavenly Lamb, the Lord of glory, before whom all powers in heaven and on earth bow in holy worship and breathless adoration. Psalms 81 Hear us, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. You who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth. God's glory will not be denied, and every heavenly being gives silent or vocal testimony to the splendor of God. In the tabernacle in the wilderness, designs representing the guardian cherubim formed a part of the mercy seat and were made of gold. Exodus 25:18. The cherubim did more than protect God's most holy place from those who had no right to be there. They also assured the high priest's right to enter the holy place with blood as the people's mediator with God. He, and he alone, was allowed to enter into the inner sanctuary of the Lord. By right of redemption and in accordance with the status of believers, each true child of God now has straightforward access as a believer priest to the presence of God through Jesus. Cherubim will not refuse the humblest Christian access to the throne. They assure us that we can come boldly because of Christ's work on the cross. The veil in the temple has been rent. As Paul says, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Ephesians 2.19 Further, Peter assures, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 2.9 The inner sanctuary of God's throne is always open to those who have repented of sin and trusted Christ as Savior. What will our resurrection body be like? Have you ever thought about what your body will look like in eternity? Our present bodies will be buried after we pass. After many years, no distinguishable feature will be left in the ground. Then we will resurrect from the dead. Will it be the same as it is now? Suffice it to say that both the bodies we will have in the resurrection and the experience we will have in the resurrection are shrouded in mystery. Yet scripture does provide some key points. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 50 to 53. Now I say this, believers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit nor be part of the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable mortal inherit the imperishable immortal. Listen very carefully. I tell you a mystery, a secret truth decreed by God and previously hidden but now revealed. We will not all sleep in death, but we will all be completely changed, wondrously transformed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trumpet call. For a trumpet will sound, and the dead who believed in Christ will be raised imperishable, and we will be completely changed, wondrously transformed. For this perishable part of us must put on the imperishable nature, and this mortal part of us that is capable of dying must put on immortality, which is freedom from death. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Corruption does not mean moral or ethical corruption, but physical, material corruption. These bodies subject to disease, injury, and one day decay are unsuited for heaven. Corruption can't inherit in corruption. We read the phrase, I tell you a mystery. A mystery in the biblical sense is simply something that must be understood spiritually rather than through human perception. In his message to the Corinthian Christians, Paul tells them something they couldn't possibly know, which could only have been known through God's revelation. In God's eternal plan, 
The dead in the Lord will receive resurrection bodies, and in an instant, all his people will be gathered to meet Jesus in the air. At that time, all of the redeemed who are still alive on earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord, where they will be given their resurrection bodies. Paul thus states that there will be a change to something else. What is that something else? The apostle writes, For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. An imperishable body replaces a perishable body, and a mortal body replaces a mortal body. The resurrection transforms us into an incorrupt and immortal reality. We therefore have a resurrection body like Jesus who defeated death, a body that God did not allow to see corruption in Sheol. Psalms chapter 16 verse 10 For you will not abandon me to Sheol, the netherworld, the place of the dead, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Being incorrupt means being free of original sin and bodily decay, whereas being immortal means living forever. There are several mysteries, for example, when Jesus is resurrected. Jesus twice appears to his disciples in a room where, as John reminds us, the door was locked. John chapter 20 verse 19 So when it was evening on that same day, the first day of the week, Though the disciples were meeting behind barred doors for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace to you. John chapter 20 verse 26 Eight days later, his disciples were again inside the house, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, though the doors had been barred, and stood among them and said, Peace to you. John wants us to understand that Jesus entered the room through a manner that was distinct from the others, which is why he emphasizes the locked door. However, even though Jesus' resurrected body is spiritual, this does not mean that he is devoid of flesh. Thomas can feel the holes in his hands and side created when the nails and spear respectively pierced him. John chapter 20 verse 27 then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger, and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but stop doubting and believe. Jesus interacts both with physical and spiritual reality, with visible and invisible things in this way. Paul employs a metaphor from farming to explain that during our lives on earth, we bury our natural bodies, and after death and resurrection, we shall be resurrected with what he refers to as a spiritual body. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 to 49. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. The human body that is sown is perishable and mortal. It is raised imperishable and immortal. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in strength. It is sown a natural body, mortal, suited to earth. It is raised a spiritual body, immortal, suited to heaven. As surely as there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. So what is written in scripture? The first man, Adam, became a living soul, an individual. The last Adam, Christ, became a life-giving spirit, restoring the dead to life. However, the spiritual, the immortal life is not first, but the physical, the mortal life, then the spiritual. The first man, Adam, is from the earth, earthy, made of dust. 
The second man, Christ the Lord, is from heaven. As is the earthly man, the man of dust, so are those who are of earth. And as is the heavenly man, so are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly, the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the heavenly, the man of heaven. In order to help us understand what our resurrection bodies will be like, Paul will provide four contrasts between our present bodies and our future resurrection bodies. All things considered, the resurrection body wins. Incorruption triumphs over corruption. Glory triumphs over dishonor. Power triumphs over weakness. Spiritual triumphs over natural. Raised in incorruption, raised in glory, raised in power. Our resurrection body will be glorious. There is nothing more uncomely, unlovely and loathsome than a dead body. But it will not be so when it shall be raised again. Then it shall be a beautiful, comely body. We shall rise in a full and perfect age, as is generally thought, and without those defects and deformities which may here make our bodies appear unlovely. Cool. For the redeemed, the promise is certain. We will also bear the image of the heavenly man. Philippians chapter 3 verse 21 repeats Paul's theme. Who by exerting that power which enables him even to subject everything to himself will not only transform but completely refashion our earthly bodies so that they will be like his glorious resurrected body. Since we will bear the image of the heavenly man, the best example we have of what a resurrection body will be like is to see what Jesus' resurrection body was like. The resurrection body of Jesus was material and could eat, yet the laws of nature did not bind it. Luke chapter 24 verses 39 to 43. Look at the marks in my hands and my feet and see that it is I myself. Touch me and see. A spear does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. After saying this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still did not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in front of them. Then their eyes were suddenly opened by God, and they clearly recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. Luke chapter 24 verse 31 While they were talking about this, Jesus himself suddenly stood among them and said to them, Peace be to you. But they were startled and terrified, and thought that they were seeing a spirit. Luke chapter 24 verses 36 and 37. Some things are simply not revealed to us yet. In spite of Moses' encounter with God, we are assured that we will one day be able to converse directly with the creator of the universe. This will be a first in the chronicles of human history. And the fact that we will have a body that is incorruptible, immortal and spiritual will be the only reason why this new hope will come true for us. Believers will one day be physically raised, just as Christ was, and we will spend eternity in actual bodies. That is one of the main points of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Jesus was raised in a physical body with flesh and bones. We will be raised like he was. Romans chapter 6 verse 5 for if we have become one with him, permanently united in the likeness of his death, we will also certainly be one with him and share fully in the likeness of his resurrection. These passages alone prove the bodily resurrection of the saints. The term spiritual body 
seems to be an oxymoron. Based on the term, the essential point is that the resurrection body cannot be wholly spiritual, otherwise it could not be a body. It is a human body, but there is something different about it, as Paul explains in context. Earlier in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul lays the foundation for his discussion of the spiritual body. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 39. All flesh is not the same. There is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. Note the illustration of differing kinds of flesh. A fish's body is perfectly suited for life in the water. The body of a bird is perfectly suited for flight. Animals have a body perfectly suited for their needs in the animal kingdom. People have a body perfectly suited for life on this earthly plane. So here's Paul's point. After the resurrection, we will have a body perfectly suited for life in heaven. That is, on the new earth in eternity. Revelation chapter 21 verse 1 Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, vanished, and there is no longer any sea. The spiritual body will be made of flesh like Jesus' body is, but a different kind of flesh than what we have now. Thus, the resurrection body will also be different from our earthly natural body in terms of splendor. The spiritual body is suited to eternal life. It is not subject to decay or death. It will not be inconvenienced by any of the physical functions necessary for life here and now. The spiritual body will be a real body but in a different mode of being. It will be an upgrade. At the resurrection, our bodies will go from version 1.0 to version 2.0. The human body in its present form has various wants and weaknesses. In this fleshly body as we know it now, we cannot enter or enjoy the kingdom of God. That will change at the resurrection. We will be transformed. Right now, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Matthew chapter 26 verse 41 And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, So you men could not stay awake and keep watch with me for one hour? Keep actively watching and praying, that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. The spirit and flesh of the believer will both be willing and capable of serving God after the resurrection. Every person will be raised from the dead according to the Bible. Daniel chapter 12 verse 2 Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, resurrect, these to everlasting life, but some to disgrace and everlasting contempt, abhorrence, as a result, everyone will have a spiritual body, but their faiths will be different. The difference is faith in Christ. John chapter 3 verse 36. He who believes and trusts in the Son and accepts him as Savior has eternal life, that is, already possesses it. But he who does not believe the Son and chooses to reject him, disobeying him, and denying him as Savior, will not see eternal life, but instead the wrath of God hangs over him continually. 1 John chapter 5, verse 12 He who has the Son by accepting him as Lord and Savior has the life that is eternal. He who does not have the Son of God by personal faith does not have the life. You will be resurrected someday, and you will receive a spiritual body. The one question we all have to answer is this. Where will you spend eternity? What happens when pets die? What the Bible says. Many of us have felt sad when we lose a family pet. 
to help ease that sadness, we often wonder where they are now. Will we ever see them again? Do dogs go to heaven? When you think about heaven, what do you imagine? Do you picture streets made of gold and seeing Jesus right in front of you? Maybe you think about reuniting with family members who have passed away. Or you might remember the promise from Revelation chapter 21 verse 4 that says, There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. No matter what you imagine, it's still limited because we are trying to understand something that is all about God. Even our best ideas about the joy of heaven can't compare to what it will truly be like. God created dogs and all animals for a good purpose. On days five and six of creation, God made all the animals. On day five, he created sea animals and birds, and he said they were good. On day six, he made land animals and humans. This might show the special bond people have with the animals that share the earth with them. We can't know for sure, but it seems likely. God intended for humans to take care of the animals. Animals are a gift and a responsibility for us. They are not equal to humans in God's eyes. I really like what Reverend Billy Graham said about his dog in heaven. I think God will have prepared everything for our perfect happiness. And if it takes my dog being there, I believe he'll be there. In two separate descriptions of the new heaven and new earth, the Bible mentions that animals will be present. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatted steer together, and a little child will lead them. The Bible talks about peaceful relationships between different animals, and this idea is repeated in three more verses as well as in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 25. While there aren't any pets like dogs or cats specifically mentioned, the mention of animals suggests we might see them in heaven too. This is where our exploration of what the Bible says about heaven meets the first important point we discussed. Heaven is even better than we can imagine. Because of the joy and love animals bring into our lives, it's possible that God will include them in our eternal life. We won't know for sure if our dogs will be in heaven with us until we get there. But we can trust that whether they are or not, we won't feel sad or empty. God's presence will fill us with happiness. We love our pets, like dogs, cats, birds, and more. And we often see them as part of our family. Recently, the idea of pets going to heaven got more attention when Pope Francis was wrongly quoted saying, Paradise is open to all God's creatures. But actually, Pope Paul IV said something similar many years earlier. So the big question remains, do our dogs go to heaven when they die? First, let's remember that God made everything for his joy and glory, including animals. People in particular were made to bring glory to God. The Bible tells us that even the sun, moon, and stars praise God. While they can't praise Him like we do, they still honor Him by shining brightly. When everything does what God created it to do, it gives glory to its Creator. Although all of God's creation is for His glory and pleasure, human beings alone were created in God's image. Animals and humans were made from the same dust and share the same breath of life. However, God created men and women in his own image. He gave them the important job of taking care of, protecting, and enjoying all of his creation. Humans, due to their capacity for reason, are capable of making intelligent and moral decisions, unlike animals. According to this view, God did not create animals with the ability to choose between right and wrong or to accept or reject salvation. Only humans were given this unique ability to reason. 
All over the world, there are many beautiful cities. But we have yet to find a city that we like better than the one we come home to at the end of our journey. Eleven times in the book of Revelation, chapters 21 and 22, we find the word city. It's the place where God and his people will live together. It's not a figure of speech, but a reference to an actual physical place. And since we will be in our physically resurrected bodies when we live in that city, we will need a physical city to live in. It's not some dream place. It's not some idea. It's an actual place. The heavenly Jerusalem is a city. Now this is not something that should surprise us because the longing for a city has been around way back from the time of Abraham. We read in Hebrews chapter 11 about Abraham that he looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. And the Hebrew Christians were told in Hebrews chapter 12 that they were to come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Paul mentions this city in his letter to the Galatians. He calls it, the Jerusalem above, and in Revelation chapter 3 verse 12, it's referred to as the city of my God and the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem is a city that is in heaven. Revelation chapter 21 verse 2 says, Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, we read in Revelation chapter 21 in verse 2 that this holy city was made ready and it came down out of heaven from God. And the phrase made ready implies that the new Jerusalem has already been completed by this time. John does not say that he saw the new Jerusalem created. He says he saw the new Jerusalem coming out of the heavens. And since God dwells in the third heaven as we've already learned, we can conclude that he is preparing this city up in the third heaven to eventually become the capital city of heaven and that final abode of his children. Revelation chapter 3 verse 12 calls it again, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Let me just give you this picture for a moment before I describe this any further. One day, the city God is building up in the third heaven is going to descend, and during the millennium, it will hover over the earth, and then during the eternal state, it will rest upon the ground, and it will be the most incredible city anyone has ever, ever envisioned. It is this city that the Lord was talking about when he said to his disciples, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What is the Lord Jesus doing now? He's working on our place. Some people call it a mansion. Call it what you will. It is the part of that future that God has for us that is under construction right now. And when it is finished and it's time for it to come into play, we're going to learn how all of this will happen. We'll walk through the gates of Pearl. And as we do, we'll be reminded that the only reason we're there is because of the suffering and the pain of the Lord Jesus who paid the wound for us that we might be redeemed. So it's a holy city with pearly gates. And then next, the Bible tells us that the foundations of the city are of precious stones. For those of us who want to be with our animal friends forever, there is good news. And I heard every created thing that is in heaven or on earth or under the earth, in Hades, the realm of the dead, or on the sea, and everything that is in them saying together, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, Christ, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. 
Revelation chapter 5, verse 13. Many passages tell us that animals have souls. I said to myself regarding the sons of men, God is surely testing them in order for them to see that by themselves, without God, they are only animals. For the earthly fate of the sons of men and the fate of animals is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. Indeed, they all have the same breath, and there is no preeminence or advantage for man, in and of himself, over an animal, for all is vanity. All go to the same place. All came from the dust, and all return to the dust. Who knows if the spirit of man ascends upward, and the spirit of the animal descends downward to the earth? Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 18 through 21. For even the whole creation, all nature waits eagerly for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration and futility, not willingly, because of some intentional fault on its part, but by the will of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will also be freed from its bondage to decay and gain entrance into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Romans chapter 8 verses 19 through 21. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. O Lord, you preserve man and beast. Psalm 36 verse 6. The Bible tells us that God's covenant is with all of his creation. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains, and everything that moves in the field is mine. Psalm 50 verses 10 through 11. And in that day, I will make a covenant for Israel with the animals of the open country, and with the birds of the heavens, and with the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow and the sword, and banish war from the land, and will make them lie down in safety. Hosea chapter 2 verse 18 The Bible tells us many times that every animal on earth praises the Lord. Let everything that has breath and every breath of life praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. Psalm 150 verse 6 now ask the animals and let them teach you that God does not deal with his creatures according to their character. And ask the birds of the air and let them tell you. Or speak to the earth with its many forms of life and it will teach you. And let the fish of the sea declare this truth to you. Who among all these does not recognize in all these things that good and evil are randomly scattered throughout nature and human life? that the hand of the Lord has done this, in whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Job chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. Psalm 69, verse 34. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praise from the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you islands and coastlands, and those who inhabit them, sing his praise. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 10. Many Christian leaders have also addressed the question of what happens to animals after they die. John Wesley, who started Methodism, taught that people are caretakers of God's creation and must look after it. When people fail to protect what God made perfectly, they sinned against him. Because of this, pain and suffering came into the world, and animals had to suffer too. The close relationship God created was broken, leading to humans being cruel to animals. Wesley believed that one day, God would create a new world where animals would be restored to their original beauty. Martin Luther, who founded the Lutheran Church, agreed with Wesley. He said, 
In paradise, there was perfect harmony between people and animals. One day, that harmony will return, and all of creation will be renewed with Christ. In his book Heaven, Randy Alcorn writes that animals like horses, cats, dogs, deer, dolphins, and even squirrels will benefit from Christ's death and resurrection. He believes that since God created these animals and loves them, we can expect to see them again on the new earth. The Bible tells us that God made animals, blessed them, and said they were good. One day, these animals will be part of his perfect kingdom. It's important to remember that God doesn't see animals differently. Some people might think their dogs and cats will be in heaven, but not the chicken they ate for dinner. Others might imagine a heaven with doves and elephants, but not the tiny mouse they trapped. However, it's not up to us to decide who gets to be there. God makes that choice, and his message is clear. The Bible doesn't directly say whether pets or animals have souls or if they will be in heaven. But we can look at some Bible teachings to help us understand. The Bible tells us that both people, Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, and animals, Genesis chapter 1 verse 30, chapter 6 verse 17, chapter 7 verses 15 and 22, have the breath of life. This means both are living beings. The big difference is that people are made in the image of God. Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 through 27, while animals are not. Being made in God's image means people can be spiritual. They have thoughts, feelings, and choices, and part of them lives on after death. If pets or animals have a soul or spirit, it would be different and lesser than that of humans. This could mean that pet or animal souls do not live on after death. Another thing to think about when wondering if pets will be in heaven is that animals are part of God's creation in Genesis. God made the animals and said they were good. Genesis chapter 1 verse 25. So it makes sense that there could be pets and animals in the new earth. Revelation chapter 21 verse 1. We can be sure there will be animals during the millennial kingdom too. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 6. Chapter 65, verse 25. We can't say for sure if some of these animals will be the pets we had on earth, but we do know that God is fair, and when we get to heaven, we will agree with his decision on this matter, no matter what it is. What does the Bible say about pets? In today's world, having pets is very common. Many families have dogs, cats, hamsters, turtles, goldfish, chinchillas, newts, parakeets, or geckos. Some people even keep unusual pets, like albino pythons or hissing cockroaches. The Bible doesn't specifically talk about having pets. The closest example is from a story told by Nathan, where a poor man had only one little ewe lamb. This lamb was special to him, he raised it and it grew up with his family. It ate with him, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. To him, it was like a daughter. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 3. We can learn a lot about pets by looking at what the Bible says on other subjects. If God cares for animals, we should too. God's love for animals helps us understand why we want pets. God made people in his image, Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, and that means we share his nature, which includes caring for animals. From the very start, God blessed people and told them, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and every living creature on the ground, Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. When a child takes care of an aquarium, they show God's nature in a special way. An aquarium is like a mini world. The child creates a safe home for the fish, keeps the water clean, and feeds them. The fish rely on the child for everything, 
just like all of creation depends on God. So, having a pet is a serious responsibility. It reflects the Creator's love and shows care for part of His creation. Many parents get a pet to help their kids learn responsibility and good values. This is a lesson we can find in the Bible. Pets also bring us friendship, fun, and unconditional love. That's why we see pets visiting hospitals and nursing homes, spreading joy to people who need it. Any animal that helps us show love is a wonderful thing. Are there really streets of gold in heaven? Look down at verse 18, then again in verse 21 of chapter 21. And the construction of its wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. And notice verse 21. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. I can't imagine it. Once again, can you imagine seeing the city as you approach it? seeing the city from afar. The gold on the outside, the precious stones on the foundations, and this beautiful sense of light that emanates from out of the city from the throne of God. This is the new Jerusalem described in the scripture. It is a fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 60 and verse 19. The sun shall no longer be your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give light to you. But the Lord will be to you an everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. When the Bible says that this city reflects light, it is not from any material combustion. It is not from any consumption of fuel. It is from the Lamb himself who is the light of the world. And in that moment, he will be the light of the city. No wonder Paul described our future like this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, he said, It is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of men, the things which God has prepared for those that love him. 